Hey everybody, before we get started with the show, I just have to come on and say that I made a little mistake with today's audio. Somehow, in recording this interview, I did not record with my usual podcasting microphone, and instead, it was recorded through my laptop microphone. Now, I've done everything in my power that I know how to do on the audio side to try to make things sound a little bit better, but it's not up to the quality that I try to bring week in and week out. If this is your first time listening, I hope you go back through our catalog and and hear how our show normally sounds. But today's interview is so truly extraordinary, and today's guest is so amazing that I still thought it was very important to put this out. And I really hope that you stick around for the less than stellar audio quality for the truly inspiring content. Thank you so much. And having said that, let's get on with the show. Here we go. Roll video. I think anybody creating something new must have an adventure. It's not cinema, it's something else. My advice to a young filmmaker is to make a movie every week. The whole bag of movies can be learned in about a day and a half. But suspense is essentially an emotional process. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta make films, you gotta make it and get a scene. Cinema for me is a world of when I dream. Welcome to Behind the Slate, everybody. I am your host, Aaron Strand. And as I am finishing up my final weeks of pre-production uh, on my feature film, I am very tired. And honestly, I, I could really use this conversation today because I am talking with a, a friend and an artist who I just have the utmost respect for. She's someone I look up to. She's someone I am inspired by. And I know that you will love to hear from her. Cecile McLaurin Salvant is a singular force in the world of modern music. Growing up in Miami, she studied piano and voice, eventually moving to France, where she studied at the Darius Millot Conservatory. There, she was introduced to jazz improvisation, and she began her career as a jazz vocalist. In 2010, she won the Thelonious Monk International Jazz Competition. Since then, she has released seven studio albums and won countless awards, including the Jazz Album of the Year by the Downbeat Critics Poll, the NPR Music's Jazz Critics Poll, the Glenn Gould Protégé Prize. She's won not one, not two, but three Grammy Awards for Best Jazz Vocal Album. And in 2020, she was the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, sometimes referred to as a Genius Grant. Beyond singing, she is a composer, arranger, textile artist, and soon-to-be filmmaker developing her original show, Ogress, into an animated feature. Most recently, some of you may have seen her singing America the Beautiful, accompanied by Sullivan Fortner, before the 2023 U.S. Open Women's Tennis Final. Ladies and gentlemen, Cecile Salvant. Cecile, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for this bio. I'm going to steal it from you. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Yeah, I, I I really take pride in my bios. I feel like I, I, I say it all the time, but I, I love a good bio, you know? That's great. And and like, I think as an artist myself, I, how many times have I like been asked to write up a bio for myself or like for my own webpage? And I'm just like, God, I just don't want to do this. And it's but tough. I get a lot of joy from writing other people's bios. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine that's better, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um. So thank you so much for joining today. Let's let's just start by talking about this recent performance at the US Open, sure. which had everybody buzzing, everybody talking with the key question, where did you get those sunglasses and how do I <laughs> how do I find a pair? <laughs> um, the glasses are from a brand called Kuberaum. It's like a German brand. And I saw them yeah. online and I just love them because they're like pierced. I mean, for those who haven't seen it. They're like pierced with earrings. It's like glasses that have their own set of earrings. <laughs> um, and I and I love them. They're very heavy. I ordered them yeah, from they- Germany. I I can't wear them. You know what I mean? Like, where am I going to wear them? But I thought this was the good, this except was the to time. the U.S. Open yeah. Women's Final. I mean, clearly, yeah. <laughs> clearly. yeah every, if you haven't seen a picture of Cecile performing at the at the Open, it's it's unreal. Uh, and the the glasses are so badass. Um, Thank but you. <laughs> now this this performance what got a lot of buzz, but also was met with a little bit of controversy in the fact that you 
you did not sing the Star Spangled Banner and you instead sang America the Beautiful. And I guess this was what most of the singers did throughout the tournament. So I'm curious, how, first of all, how did this opportunity come about and when was the song choice decision made? So the president of the board there uh, is a fan of mine. So this is one of those situations where it's like, I I was like, this is a big stage. Like I know that this is not something that like my manager secured or like a group of random people were like, oh, we should get, you know, I knew that it had to be someone who like personally liked my music and it happened to be the president of the board and he gets to choose who sings these every couple of years, I think. And so he was like, I want Cecile to do it. And they were, they said, fine. Uh, as for the song choice, I actually had no say. Um, well, actually, I did have a say. They suggested either, they said either sing God Bless America or America the Beautiful. Um, I was never, I, I thought someone else was singing the Star Spangled Banner. Um, and then I realized when I got there, they were like, oh, no, you're the only person singing today, the an, an anthem. I think they are doing that and I don't think they're saying why they're doing that because no one told me why why no Star Spangled Banner. I love that song for all its controversy. But I think it's because <laughs> of its controversy that they were like, you know what, we're not we're not gonna do the, the so they did an instrumental version of it earlier in the day. And I think they were like, we're not we're not gonna do that song. Like it's just it's too there's it's too fraught. Like it's just you know what I mean? So Yeah. I, I find it to be interesting, and I learned a lot about America the Beautiful. I also got some backlash because, so I did, you know, my little nerdy research and found all of these other verses. Um, the song is written by a woman named Kathy Bates, not to be confused with <laughs> our Kathy Bates. This is of Kathy about Bates. Schmidt fame. Yeah, no, this is <laughs> Kathy Bates from another century. She was a teacher at Wellesley. She was in what they call, or what they called a Boston marriage or a Wellesley marriage, which means that she was living with another Wellesley professor, a woman. Uh, they oh. may or may not have been lesbians, <laughs> or they may have been platonic. No one knows. But if you ask me, I'm like, mm. <laughs> and yeah. uh and so, and, and the woman that she lived with in this Boston marriage was also named Kathy. Anyway, uh, I read all the lyrics, all the verses, and I found it to be so incredible that, you know, on that part where it says, God shed his grace on thee, there's like one of the verses has God mend thine every flaw. And I yes. thought, this is perfect. Like, I've never heard of a patriotic song that is willing to like celebrate the beauty, but is also saying, Hey, it's not all, it's all, it's not all beautiful. There are flaws and like, there's something hopeful about it and beautiful. And to me, patriotic as crazy as that is, I'm not a, an extremely patriotic person, I would think. Um, but in that moment I was like, yeah, this is, this is great. This actually makes me feel more patriotic to, to read this. And I thought I will I will sing this uh, as part of like as part of the the, the performance uh, at the U.S. Open, and so I kind of slipped it in there, and then I ended it with "God shed His grace on me and crowned Thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea," and there are a few people uh, you know on social media as they will who were like that was I can't believe you you know you you changed you twisted the words to feed your disgusting narrative. And I thought it was just so interesting because many people thought I made up the words or I rewrote the words and then just like, no, I just did my research. I didn't write it. And I also find it to be very interesting. Sorry that I'm rambling on. <laughs> no, this is fascinating. <laughs> but I also find it to be interesting that, you know, I could be like, I could be talking, I could be a conservative. Like no one knows what my, I could be talking about flaws like, on the Democrat side or on the liberal sure. side, like saying, you yeah. know, this country is going, is, is spiraling out yeah. of control with all of these trans yeah. people. You know what I mean? I could have been yeah, God mend by every lib. Yeah. Exactly. You don't know <laughs> what I, of course, I think the glasses gave away that I might not be necessarily um, <laughs> on their side, but, but I thought it was interesting because I was like, you don't know what flaws I'm talking about. Yeah. But anyway, it was, it was, 
It was interesting. I mean, it was a really fun experience and really scary, too. What was the scary part of it? Well, I couldn't stop thinking of, like, memes and videos. I kept thinking about Fergie, and I kept thinking about, like, oh, memes yeah. of, like, people screwing up the national anthem, forgetting the words. So I was like, I'm going to forget the words. I'm going to screw this up. It's going to be, like, viral in a ba really bad way. Like, people will make fun of me because I'm going to mess it up. Um, but particularly with the words, I was like, I'm going to forget the words and I'm going to just like blank out. And there's like 24,000 people in the room and there's millions of people around like the world watching and I'm going to screw it up. <laughs> have, ha I'm, have you ever blanked on words before yes. in performance? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. But it's always been like smaller performances right. and it's okay. And it's like songs that people don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but that's happened to me. And it's like. It's ultimately it's fine, but this one was the one where it was like, really, you can't like, girl, you really can't. You got to yeah. have it together. So what do you when you're experiencing that fear? What sort of techniques do you have to move through it? I crocheted and I sang the song over and over while crocheting before going on stage. And then I was like, you know this, like, I, I've known this. We know this song. Come on. Like, I, I think it's just like a weird thing that you can do to yourself you can like create a nervous energy and you can create like one thing that I remember that I did to myself that really screwed me up earlier in my career like maybe five years ago but Bef right before a gig I was like I wonder how many words I'm singing tonight and I just messed myself up I was like oh my god and I was going word by word like I was no longer in flow singing the songs I was just like what's the next word what's the next word what's the next word and I would I blanked and it was, it was not good. And I was just like, it's too much to remember. You know, that thing where you go, it's too much to remember. No one will remember. No one can remember this. Right. And then it's terrible. I, I think about that with, with actors too. I just go, oh my God, if I was like, I just saw Sweeney Todd on Broadway the other day. And one of the actors kind of blanked on something. And then he like double, he was like, you, you could see him hesitate. And then he just doubled down and it was fine. Right. And it almost felt like he was acting the hesitation right and I go oh my god like just the idea of like being on Broadway and performing these these words and like acting and you're on a stage and you're on like one of the great stages right and people are watching you and you blank and you blank across from another actor oh I just I I don't know if I'd be able to like recover that quickly and just pull it back up and go okay we keep going you know I, I mean, obviously, like not on that level of stage, but I, I definitely remember having those fears, particularly around Shakespeare, like in conservatory yeah, and like, imagine. and thinking that and then like learning from somebody like uh, Mark Rylance, who's like the greatest Shakespearean actor I've ever seen. And, you know, seeing him walk on stage on Broadway and like seeming to, you know, he, I mean, this is like part of the illusion, right? Part of the effortlessness of his artistry, but it looks like he's leaping into the unknown as if he's oh. like forgetting the words every time you know what i mean and then yeah. he's fine those little moments of indecision or uncertainty are then like propelling him to the next idea yeah. it's just like oh my god it's it's just incredible but that's great where it feels like the person is coming up with what they're saying as they're saying it they're saying it they're thinking right. it and saying it it's Right. Yeah, there is something that's great about that, for sure. Although I will say that despite your maybe your experience as the artist who's like stepping on stage and like thinking about, I'm going to forget the words, you carry that effortlessness into your Thank performance you. as Thank well. You. Where it, it, I mean, and probably why people thought you were like making up those words like on the <laughs> yeah. spot or you had like rewritten them. Yeah. Um, because it does it you you create that like essence of inspiration. Um, Thank you. Uh, which which it's actually an idea I'll circle back to a little bit later. But I want to take I want to ask you another question and take mm -hmm. you sort of back to the beginning. So going back in your journey, you were clearly an artsy kid, singing, playing music, singing in choirs, stuff like that. At that age, what did you think an artist was, a and did you want to be one? when you were growing up? Ooh, what did I think an artist was when I was a kid? Um, I don't think I thought of the idea of like an artist. I think that came a little bit later. I think that came when I was maybe in my teens. But as a kid, I just thought, I want to make stuff. Um, I want to write plays. I want to like make up an imaginary world. 
I want to be in the image world and the imaginary world. I want to play dress up. I want to be in costume. I want to be a bunch of different people. Um, but it didn't feel like being an artist. It just felt like, I don't know. It just felt like play. It just felt like this is, you know, and it was the way that I played back, back in that day. I remember when my cousin would come over in the summer, we would just, I'd just be like, okay, we're doing imaginary land. And this is, this is the setting. These are the characters. This is the plot this is what's going on, you know? Um, and it was so, so fun. We do it in the pool too. I brought up in Miami. I had a pool. I was lucky enough to have a pool. So we would do like imaginary like worlds in the pool and we'd be like in a ship and, so it just felt like, yeah, it just felt like part of life to 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 be making stuff up, to be drawing, to be, you know, I wonder this a lot about like kids where it's like kids don't really identify as artists, but they are constantly making stuff and they're constantly like making what we know to be as adults, quote unquote, art, right? Um, and then I would say also, I was watching my mom and my sister who uh I would describe as like Sunday painters like they had jobs they were doing other stuff but they had their artistic practice they made you know oil paintings sculptures paper mache sculptures textile art and just for themselves like not to show anywhere not to sell just for fun so I always saw that like people making art but no one said it was art, but literally people making art and being creative just just to like blow off some steam, just to have fun, just to like do something of the weekend. And so I think I've always had that relationship with with the word art, where it's just like it was never it was never I never saw it as something that was in a museum or I did go to museums. But the art that I, art making that I saw was very casual, very personal, very intimate, and not at all about uh, any kind of relationship with an audience or with, with you know, people who would come see the, the paintings. So I think it's only later, you know, being around friends, being around, like being in college, that type of stuff, being around other people who wanted to make art. That's when I think the, the idea of it started coming alive and I thought oh wow okay there is such a thing so what was what was the moment where you decided that art was more than just sort of like blowing off steam and that this was something you were gonna pursue as a career and what do you think the the impetus was behind that decision I think I never really decided to pursue it I was I was very passive I I wanted to sing I kind of wanted to be an opera singer but I didn't really pursue it after high school, I moved to France because my mom suggested that I should move to France. I didn't know where I wanted to study. I didn't know where I wanted to live. So I moved to this small town in the southeast of France called Aix-en-Provence. And I went to the conservatory because I had always gone to music classes. So it was just more of the same that I had always done. I went to a political science prep school with an option of a first year of law. And I just kept sort of doing what I had been doing before, which is a very rigorous academic situation with music sort of on the side. And I didn't think, oh, I'm going to become a singer. I'm going to make do, do this for a living. It just seemed, it seemed so far-fetched. But I also sort of liked the idea of like, maybe, oh, maybe I could be an opera singer. Maybe. But um, it was really my jazz teacher who was very encouraging and he was just like, yeah, you need to pursue this. You need to do this. Like, there's something here. You're, you know, you can do this for a living. And I'd just be like, eh, probably not, though, right? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> probably not. And that's probably remnants of, like, growing up and just being around people who are like, well, yeah, we like to make stuff. Like, my dad loves to play the piano, but he's a doctor. You know what I mean? Like, probably not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it just... It, it took time and then I just kept telling myself, okay, I'll just see what happens. I'll see what happens next the next month. And if it doesn't work out, I'll just go back to school and like study something and like get a real job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I, I sort of kept that mentality even to this day of just like, well, we're going to see what this next month is. Uh, because I do think that 
very early on, I just always knew that this is such a fickle, 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 fickle uh, industry. And it's, you know, you can't trust it completely. You can't, you don't know, like, you know what I mean? Nothing is guaranteed. Not that anything is guaranteed elsewhere, but. There's a lot more structure elsewhere. Exactly. Exactly. And like, you know, people might like you today and then they forget you. And as you get older, maybe you become like, you know, middle-aged or mid-career, as they like to say. It's like, it's less glitzy and glammy and like, you know, it's. So I just always, maybe it's defensiveness, but I always had this idea of like, we'll see what happens. And if, if I have to go back to school and like study something else and just like figure out something else, I'll always have music for myself. I'll always love music. I'll always be able to draw. But, um, but it was never this thing of like, I need a career. I have this ambition to like become famous or anything like that. Never that. What would you say is... Um, what was the first kind of break, uh, for you? Uh, you know, you're taking this like month by month approach. When was the moment when the universe conspired to take you by the hand into this life? Uh, I think the monk competition, uh, winning the monk competition, which is like this international uh, jazz competition that every year it changes instruments. And it was sort of the first time I was performing in the U S for like a larger audience. I had been singing in France in this small town for, for a couple of years. And it was also the first time that an audience laughed at uh, the lyrics that I was performing, which I think that was maybe <laughs> huge. It was like bigger than even winning the competition because it was like, it was a moment of realization of like, oh, I've been bombing all these years. I pick these songs that have these great, funny lyrics, and I'm singing for French audiences. They don't get it. They're not laughing. So like, <laughs> you know what I mean? There was like a feeling of isolation. Suddenly I was like, oh my God, they get it. <laughs> well, do you remember what was the, do you remember what the line was? That you got I don't remember laugh? the line, but the song is a song uh, that Bessie Smith used to sing called Take It Right Back. And it's just this woman who's like, fed up with her her dude and she's just like take it back to the place where you got it because i don't want any of it here like that's the that's the refrain and she's just like yeah, uses yeah. all of these different images to describe how he's just like a nightmare and people were laughing <laughs> and i thought you know i was just like oh my god <laughs> wait <laughs> wait a minute you know and and that sort of also was part of the, what convinced me to like go back to the states and you know, if I'm going to do this, I want to, I want to sing, I, I want to sing here. I want to sing for an English speaking audience. I want to sing with American musicians um, and just really see what happens. So, so I think that was, that was a big, big moment. And I moved to New York because I got like, you know, with, with that competition, you get a prize of, uh, I think at the time it was like $25,000, but that you could only spend towards education. Oh. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll just go to like a college for a semester. Like I had always been curious about college over here. So I went to the new school for one semester. Um and that basically took all the money. <laughs> took all the money. <laughs> Which is crazy. Um and I was just like, did, here did, new did, school. Did you stu- did you study voice at new school? I studied voice. Say- well, actually, I studied classical voice. I studied piano, um, like jazz piano, a classical piano. I did a little bit of like combo stuff, like group writing and, and uh, ear training and stuff like that. Um, gotcha. I was like, it'd be funny if you got the twenty if you got the twenty five k and you're like studied economics or like I know can you like some Marxist philosophy or something? I should have. I truly should have just like literature <laughs> <laughs> if I could go back. But yeah, so it got me to New York. It got me in the clubs, uh, like the jazz clubs in New York. It got me to just meet a bunch of musicians that I ended up later playing with and 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 uh, working with. Yeah. What prompted you to sign up for the Monk competition? My what, mom. What were you expecting? Your mom. Wow. My mom, not I. My mom had a file. I remember I was twenty at the time. She had a, a like a file with all of the jazz competitions, all the vocal jazz competitions around the world. She was the ambitious one. I was just like, 
didn't care. Wow. And she said, oh, there's this competition. And she would call them. I mean, she had she already knew about the competition years before that. And she called them every year, basically, like, what instrument is it this year? And she called them on the vocal year. And she, they were like, it's voice this year. And she was like, Cecile, you better send your audition tape. And, of course, I sent my audition tape, like, the day it was supposed to come in. Like, I was so late. I was just so passive. I didn't care. I had just lost another competition that my mom suggested I do in France. So I was like, there's no way I'm getting in. Like, I'm losing in France. I'm not going to win something that's international. Um, and so, yeah, she she was the one. And what I thought that was going to happen was literally that I would completely lose. I was just like, there's, I'm not going through to finals. It's just going to be semifinals. And I'm just going to try to have fun and, like, push through my nervousness. But I heard all of the other singers, like... Um, rehearse for it and I was like they're incredible they're great like I'm losing it's and somebody from the competition came up to me and they were like just want you to know like even if you don't make it to the top like you're all winners like she came to me specifically to tell me that and I was like oh she she knows that it's not gonna work out so it was all a surprise going through and winning that experience did that did that change anything for you personally? Like, did you start to see yourself differently after that? Initially, I did think, oh, my God, like, what if, like, I'm going to be famous now? <laughs> I'm not like, oh, my God, like, what if this is, like, great, like, this is the big break and, like, what's going to happen? Like, and I was kind of scared. I was like, what could happen? Like, this is huge. And then nothing happened. Like, all the people that I had met that were like, we want to play with you. Like, it was so nice hearing you. We're going to stay in touch. Like, nobody stayed in touch. It was like a very, like, American New York thing of like, yeah, you're great. And then no one talks to you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it was also just like realization of like, oh, this is jazz. Like, let's be real. Like, this is not going to, you're not going to have paparazzi, like, waiting for you outside. Like, relax. Everybody relax, you know? <laughs> and like, I went back to my little small village in France. I went back to my music school and everything was just normal. And so I totally like within like a week of winning that thing, I was just like, Oh, okay. That was just like a fun time. And I don't know that it's going to really bear any fruit. It was, it was a cool experience. But I was no longer under the impression of like, my whole life is going to change, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. But I'm curious. So then, you know, in the subsequent years, as your career and reputation as a jazz singer does grow, um, I'm curious because it, it, you talk about like, it's jazz, like it is what it is. But the fact that it is jazz, it also comes with all these inevitable comparisons uh, to these like great you know, capital G great artists of the past, uh, particularly these great, this great legacy of female vocalists. What did it feel like? And maybe what does it still feel like to ha have that relationship to the past? And does that affect your present? Like, is it something that weighed on you? What were you, how did that feel? Um, well, I personally don't, I don't think about these things too much. And I don't read anything that's written about me. I don't watch anything about me. So I wasn't like in touch with any comparisons like on a daily basis or even thinking about it. I'm just, I'm very like blinders on just move forward, get interested in what you want to get interested in, like try to get better at what you want. So it wasn't a weight on me, I, I have to say, but I do think that there was another kind of weight, which is the weight of like peers so they're not, you know, my peers are certainly not saying, oh, you, you sound like, you know, X, Y, or Z, or you're in the tradition of X, Y, or Z. But I still didn't want to sound like there's like a thing of like not wanting to sound bad or wanting, but just around the band and around the musicians that I play with, that was the most pressure or like not wanting to do something that they thought was corny or not wanting to do something that like they thought wasn't authentic or whatever it was. So it was more that community that I think unknowingly I felt a pressure from. And, you know, teachers, I, th I think this is, this might've been the case with you too, right? Where it's like the teachers and the mentors and the people you look up to, it's like, you do look up to them, but they do kind of apply a certain pressure even without like doing it on purpose. Oh yeah. So so that was, I think, something that I think I'm probably still living with that. 
and it's also so it's so insidious because you don't know necessarily that it's really there. Like you can't really put your finger on it. And you're saying things like you'll be saying things that actually came straight from the mouth of someone else. Right. You're like, oh, yeah. oh it should be this. And, and if you think about it, you're like, wait, well, I never really believed that it should be this. But I've been hearing that from the higher ups, but, and the higher ups are artists that you admire or mentors or teachers, right. Or peers. <laughs> Def- I definitely relate. Um, Cause yeah, when it's happening subconsciously, it's kind of, you know, it kind of just happens. But once that little light of awareness shines on these habitual repetitions or the way that when I, when I suddenly become aware of how I've donned a different mask around the different people that I'm around. <sighs> yes. Um, and particularly when I'm trying to like, be the artist that I hope they see me as. Yes. Um, I guess. Uh, it, I, and then I suddenly, if I become aware of it in the moment, then it's just like ultimate cringe. Um, as our friend Yvette says, it's very crunchy. Um, yes. So, um, uh, so I can't, how, how have you, how do you kind of navigate those, those moments uh, for you? Well, I'm, you know, I suffer from being a people pleaser. And I think that that, um, that makes, me making any kind of art extremely difficult uh, and being creative ex- and sharing it extremely difficult because there's always going to be this level of people pleasing. Even in my, like, even when I try to provoke, I'm still like, I'm still holding <laughs> on to it, you know? Yes. Yes. And it's, it's tough because I think it's really limiting. And, and so I, uh, all I've tried to do is just chip away at it little by little, um, song by song, choice by choice. But it's, it's, it's really a big um, conflict that I have. It's like, how do I reconcile being such a crazy people pleaser and also wanting to be just like the most, like, I just want to be free creatively. I just want to like make whatever, you know, And also there's like, you know, internal things of like people pleasing with myself, like, you know, these things that you don't see, you know, going back to that idea of like these limits and these boundaries and like these boxes that I've put myself in and that I've created. And it's like, I don't even see it. I don't see the box, (laughs) but it's, but it's there. And so it's just like chipping away at it and trying to gain a little bit more awareness. Uh, And I, I find that, I mean, one of the easiest ways to start gaining a little bit more of that awareness is to like, to, you know, look at artists that I, that I deeply admire for, for, you know, their non people pleasing, you know, for, for them being completely uh, free to do whatever they want. I mean, as, as free as they can be. And I think about somebody maybe like Laurie Anderson, you know, or, or even a Bjork, right. People like that where you go, okay. Look at that. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. Or a David Lynch, right? You know, it's so funny because like knowing you and then and then and then also like seeing you, you know, in your like artist place, you give such an essence of freedom and it's see and you you do present that like these are things that you have. Um, but I think it's always so interesting the the relationship between our internal experience of of these issues and how sometimes they can lead to that kind of like presentation. I'm wondering if even just based on what you said earlier in this conversation, do you, has it, is it leaning into some of that, like that, some of those childlike impulses of play and some of those childlike impulses of, of dress up and like just making art for the sake of making art does, is that, has that provided some sort of solace or framework for you to yes. move through these, these boxes? Yes. Um, I, I often go back to just like one phrase. It's not even a phrase. It's just three words, which is arts and crafts. <laughs> and just being like, <laughs> it's arts and crafts. It's arts and crafts. It's arts and crafts. Like it really I thought is. you were about to say something like so profound. Like, no, like no. you must overcome. <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> It's my. I love it. It's my. Yes. Yeah. It's like it's arts and crafts. Joanne's it's googly fabrics. eyes. It's yeah. Joanne fabrics. It's googly eyes. It's like sticking googly eyes on a thing and being like here. It's it's the it's the turkey with the hand. Yes. And like I try to just remember that. Um, 
and there's like you know I've, I I'm a big fan of of course I'm a big fan of the morning pages of the artist's way although I've never really done it I just I just do the morning pages uh, there's another artist that I really love that I find is so incredible for like unblocking this kind of stuff um, her name is Linda Berry she's a comics artist she wrote hmm. a book called Making Comics and she talks a, a lot about this like the shame that sets in with children when they start realizing that they can't draw the way they want to draw or the way they think they should draw. So when the gap starts to happen and she teaches adults to like get back to drawing and she, she has classes where she has like four year olds teach adults like how to be artists, you know what I mean? And like work together. Wow. And she's, she's fantastic. She's also really great at, helping with storytelling devices and just like, um, so, so those, you know, those two ladies, Julia Cameron, and Linda, Linda Berry, and, oh, I'll give you another one, Maria Bamford. She's, she's huge for me. Maria Bamford is a stand-up comedian that I find hilarious. And she wrote an audio book called You Two Are, no, You Are a Comedy Special. I think that's what it's called. You are a comedy special. And it's like a 12 step program on how to write a comedy special. And she says in the beginning, she's like, comedy special is a stand in for whatever it is that you're trying to make. Like it could yeah. be a sandwich, you know, and <laughs> it's so good. I really highly recommend this. I think you actually love it. And so, you know, these, these, I, I just draw inspiration from these people who seem to, I think struggle. Like I think, People like Linda, people like Maria Bamford, people like Julia Cameron. I think these are people who struggled. And yes. that's why they're able to like write about how to like get out of this hole that we can get in sometimes. And even beyond in a creative way, just like in life, you know. Like you threw out like Laurie Anderson, for example. It's such a great example of somebody who kind of gives this essence of like pure artistry. But then again, like what is she using as the raw materials of that pure artistry? It's like the struggle of her yes, life. And, absolutely. And th the raw materials of her, her emotions and her physical, you know, prop problems. Absolutely. You know? For some reason, I see that in another artist. And then for some reason, when it's like comes to myself and I'm experiencing some sort of emotional or turmoil or like, I'm, you know, I just uh, I just came off of set of like shooting for five days and then immediately had to move two days later. And it, I'm, I'm tired and my kid is like not sleeping in the new house or whatever. Yeah. And when you're sort of in it, it's just like, oh, my God, like, this is so hard. I can't even make the art I'm supposed to be making. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> of course. Like, right? No one it's else like, has this issue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm the only one. I'm yeah. the only one who could under possibly understand this. Yeah. When it's when uh, it's actually the the that is the raw material of of a potential idea. And, Absolutely. Um, and that can be the the great gift of living a, a an artistic life is that there's this in, is if you're willing to accept it, there's a an intrinsic silver lining to every dark cloud. To everything. Uh, to everything. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm curious when you just getting a little bit more sort of um, technical here. When you approach a song, what, what? How do you get into finding the life of that song? Do you do you try to do you kind of have an intellectual process? Is it emotional? Do you learn by doing? And how do you make the gap between uh, that song and the raw material of your own life? I think it starts with picking the song. So because I spend so much time and it's so precious to me to pick a song that's already like three steps into the process I guess because it's like mm. I'm only ever going to sing something that I feel completely like compelled to sing because it surprises me because it makes me laugh because it makes me angry or because it makes me feel like like it's it's a really deep and strong reaction that I have to a song and then I and then I want to sing it so already I feel connected to it if I'm going to, if I'm singing it. And then I think there's a lot of stuff that happens intuitively. There's a lot of stuff that happens on stage during performances. I, I like to give myself a little challenge of like trying to perform it differently every single time I, I play it, whether that's in the melody, whether that's in the interpretation, trying to have a different take on it. Um, and if we do it like a hundred times, then there's, you know, a hundred practice runs of like a different angle. Um, 
so I don't think I'm very calculating with it. I think it's all it's all very emotional. But also, I mean, it's all it, you know. I I like a song that makes me think, and I like a song that surprises me. So I don't know if that's an emotional reaction or if that's more intellectual. But yeah, I want a left turn. So. So that to me as a singer, I think that's, it's my responsibility to really highlight and translate the left turn. I want people to understand why I love the song um, and why I think it's so fabulous. So that I think is my, my responsibility. I go, I, I really want people to, to see how beautiful this song is uh, rather mm-hmm. than to see how good I am. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't, think in that way I think oh I really want people to hear how compelling this story is right or or this character that notion of the left turn I just want to make make sure I I understand that is it is it an element of surprise that you're trying to bring like how would you yes. describe the left turn yeah element of surprise I would say something like uh there's a song called mad about the boy it's by by Noel Coward mm-hmm. um yeah. and it's such a good song and and she says yes. it's pretty funny but i'm mad about the boy he has a gay appeal that makes me feel there may be something sad about the boy and then at the at the bridge she she says i'm hardly sentimental uh love isn't so sublime i've got to pay my rental and i go i've got to pay my rental you're you're singing a torch song you're singing this epic torch song about how like you're so just like completely crazed over this guy. And then this really mundane quotidian thing comes in there. And to me, like that's kind of a left turn where I go, Oh, I, you've got my attention. And also it just makes it more moving to me somehow. Cause we're in these epic proportions of like, I'm, you know, I'm so in love. And then suddenly we're talking about the rent. I love that. So I love songs that do that. Yes. Yes. Same. And a, and a dramatist like coward, who's who's working in this um you know that whole like early 20th century british wit that note that sort yes. of like part parlor music and the ability to like twist you know like you could just imagine yes. him at a party playing the piano and like having that little like wink side little wink and joke and it's such Absolutely. a quality that's like that's like like in a lot of like um, uh, american pop music right now like does not exist so it's like this i little, know yeah. i miss that i miss that little like witty sarcastic ironic twist to things i feel like everything is feels a little too earnest you know everything or not earnest it just feels a little too like what's the word i'm looking for because it's actually not earnest but it doesn't have like this intrinsic kind of wink and humor to it. Like I'm, I'm missing that. There's a, there's a kind of a, I don't know. Maybe this, this isn't quite the right word either, but a materialism to it. It's sort of like, mm. this is what it is. Like, this exactly. Is, Cause it, cause it's almost like optimized for social media where it's not about a song yeah. that like unfolds before you during the experience of listening, but it's a, uh, it's for marketing purposes where you can say, this is the thing and this is what it is. And you can yes. understand it in five seconds. Yes. No puns, no double meanings. Like, just yeah. one straight thing. Here it is. Yeah. It's strange. Um, you know, I, I talked earlier about this quality of effortlessness, which I think is like the true marker of, you know, a, a really exceptional artist. And 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 you have this this in spades. Thanks, now, man. I know that the quality of effortlessness comes as a byproduct of a lot of effort, which is one of the great <laughs> sort of ironies of, of, of the craft. So I'm curious, how, how would you describe the relationship between talent and preparation and how that leads towards, you know, a, a feeling like effortlessness? Um, I think that, I think that as I see it with some of my favorite artists, it's like, it's like an iceberg, right? Like there's so much below the water that goes into it. Um, for me, it's a lot of research preparation. It's not so much vocal preparation. It's not so much vocal work, but it's a lot of stuff around the song, around what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to play piano. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm constantly trying to push myself to, get better at almost at these side things that feel like they don't have anything to do with it, but they actually end up having to do with it. Um, and, and, you know, never being content, never being happy <laughs> with what I'm doing. Like just <laughs> always being like, okay, what, what's next? How do I get better? At, you know, what do I, 
what do I do? What do I need to do? What's on the to-do list? Like just this like ravenous thing. I think that's, that's really where I exist is like, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think of things as being effortless because even if let's say something is effortless, like let's say I, I don't know. I sing happy birthday. Like I'm, I'm already, I'm like thinking about like, okay, where is this from? What do I, what do I do next? Like, what's the next song? Like, what are we, you know what I mean? How do we, what are we writing? What are we working on? What's the next project? So it's, it's not, it it would be nice if it was a little bit more effortless. It would be nice if there was a little (laughs) bit more peace, but there's, there's no peace. And it's ultimately it's fun. I mean, it's a lot of fun. That reminds me of the uh, the Julia Cameron concept of filling the well, um, yes. and that it sounds to me like you're you're filling the well of the song or the performance with all these sort of other just like inspirational threads, so that when you do step out on stage, it's you're just you have all these toys to play with because of yeah. the that world of research that you've kind of created around. Is that would that be a somewhat accurate? Absolutely, absolutely. But I do have this, and I do think that I have an issue, which is that I don't think I see myself as a singer. Like, I'm never, I'm, so I have to, like, that's one of the things I'm trying to really change is that I never focus on the task task at hand. I'm an exoticist. So if I need to be working on, like, a vocal piece, I will find some piano piece that is too hard for me to play, and I will, I'll be like, I need to learn that now (laughs) in all 12 keys. And it's like, no, you actually don't. I mean, I think this is part of why I started doing visual art is just like, oh, nobody wants me to do visual art. I must, like, I must make a giant embroidered <laughs> piece. And it's like, well, no, maybe you should be practicing like the song that you have coming up for this next gig. And I think I'm just such an escapist. Like, I just got to do something else. I got to find something else. Um, and so it's, in a way, it's good because I think it feeds what I end up doing. Yeah. But it is like a little bit of this like jack of all trades, master of none, always like tabs, multiple tabs going on at once in the <laughs> safari of my life, you know, and always like if we have to do something now for this, I'm like, oh, no, but what about like, I kind of want to write a play. And it's like, no, don't write a pl- like learn the song for tonight. Like there's no play to be writing. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I have to manage that a little bit, honestly. So when you say that that's a quality that you're working on, like, what does that work look like for you? I, you know, little mantras, little like posts. It's like task, focus on the task at hand. Try to find the world in what it is that you're actually currently doing. Uh, so one of the projects that I'm working on now, and hopefully, please, I hope that I will stick to this <laughs> is that I want to be able to play. I, I Maybe I sing, I don't know, a couple, maybe 300, 200, 300 songs, I, I guess. I don't know how many songs I sing, but I would like to be able to play all of them at the piano, like learn all the songs and not necessarily accompany myself, but like know how to like play them on a very basic level. I think that that's not too much to ask <laughs> of myself, <laughs> but you know, I know how I am. Like I have a tendency to be like, oh yeah, but there's like this really nice Bach piece that I want to, that I want (laughs) to learn, you know, or like maybe, maybe I should play the lute. So I do have a lute. I bought a lute (laughs) because I was like, I should play the lute. Like that would be fantastic. So I'm going to really try to learn these songs, but it's kind of boring. You know, it's boring to be here now. It's like, I don't want to be here. We're learning the 300 songs. Yeah. Yeah, that I already sing, but I know that it will make me a better singer. It'll make me hear better. It'll develop my ear. It'll it'll give me different ways of singing the song. It'll give me a way in that I haven't had before. It'll make me have more awareness of what everyone else is playing. Sure. So it's it'll be great for me, but you know I gotta I gotta stick to it. Sure. Over a long period of time. You know, this is one of those moments where uh, a teacher's voice is bonking around in my brain. Yes. This is a phrase that I truly believe in, that I repeat all the time, and which is the concept of that you, the hardest thing as a working artist is that you have to develop a talent for your talent. It's yeah. not just about developing the talent, but it's the talent of, of harnessing that creative impulse not letting it destroy you, which like I spent most of my early career like doing and indulging Mm. and then 
and then working with it like when you're in this moment of like okay you have the creative impulse to learn your 300 songs on piano and then you start down that road and you go oh god this is like really hard and not as fun as i as it, yeah as it it's, should boring. Be. it's boring it's yeah. boring oh and there's a lute over there and like yes. should i should i take the lute road like i don't know you know and and <laughs> and managing that the, that you know whether you want to call it an inner child or managing that sort of wandering gaze yeah. is the the real work Yes. And everything that is made is just a byproduct of that. Yes, absolutely. And also, yeah, sometimes you have to indulge that wandering thing because that's that's where you find really important stuff too. So it's hard to know the balance of it, but um, but I think that's that's part of the challenge of it all. So let me ask you this because I am I, I'm in a moment in my career in the sort of a, a a a strange moment, but I have a feeling that that you can you will probably relate. Um, and I'm curious that if you have any sort of advice for for where I'm at. That's what all this was really about. <laughs> I, I really, really just wanted this. Um, it's all about me. Um, uh, so, <laughs> but you know, so I'm 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 uh, in production on this feature film, which will hopefully be my first feature. Um, so shot. great! Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, the shooting periods were broken up into two shooting periods. So I just came off set where we shot for five days, had, you know, really awesome experience of watching this team of artists that a lot of whom hadn't worked together. And I hadn't worked with any of them, watching them gel together and, and solve problems and, and work together. And I think do some really excellent work. And now we have this like two month down period where we go back into pre-production, getting ready for our final shoot dates. Um, and I'm coming off the high of, of set, uh, you know, but also like the insecurity of like, is like gnawing at the back of my head of like, was that really good enough? Like, is mm. that, is that emotion, uh, is it lying to you? The part of me that's also like, like this better be good. Like this is your, this is your shot. Like this better be, yeah. uh, you know, you, you gotta make, you gotta make good on this. Um, and you better get the material success that, that you think uh, needs to happen. Um, you know, so like that voice is kind of like bonking around in my brain. And then, of course, there's just a bunch of like actual work that needs to be done, whether it's like getting people paid or like lots of like boring administrative stuff. And anyway, all this is sort of like swirling around as I, you know, gear up for this next shoot period. I'm curious, do you have just do you relate to this sort of like coming out of a recording session or have you had moments of of, of where this sort of voice has come up in your brain and uh how have you moved through that i i hate to say that it's kind of a rarity for me to have that voice because i am so always champing at the bit for the next thing of like what am i gonna make next that i don't and i think that's a defensive tactic that's me being defensive mm. that's me saying i don't I'm scared, actually, of indulging in that voice. So it's probably somewhere in the back, like, don't fuck this up, Josh. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can curse, but... You can definitely curse. Okay. <laughs> you know, don't don't fuck this up. Like, this is it. Like, And I think US Open was a good example of that, of like, don't screw this up. <laughs> like, if you screw this up, this is terrible. Like, it'll be terrible. But, but ultimately, I'm still, I think, I'm thinking ahead to the next... I always have like one finger or like one toe in the next project, like even just imagining what the next project is. And I think that's helpful in order to not, because I also feel like, okay, it's about, to me, I, I fully believe in the body of work. You know, it's not about one project. It's about this full body of work that we're going to be building for the rest of our lives. And, this is just one this is one part of it but it's not it's not a complete finished thing you know so each project is not a complete finished package it's just like a part it's like a brick in a larger structure that we're building and I think that's helpful because then it, you go okay this brick might be a little bit irregular this brick might be smaller than the other you know this little but it doesn't matter because it's it's this larger thing. And these are, you know, I think of the artists that I super admire, people like Louise Bourgeois. It's like, there's so much work. There's so much stuff that it's like, it, you can you can no longer 
You're no longer like singling out one thing and going, you're going, oh, well, this wasn't as good as the other one, or this was a little bit better, or this was different, or this was a left turn. But it doesn't, it, you know, ultimately it doesn't matter because you're looking at this broader body of work. So that's that's how I would think of it. I don't know if that's helpful to you at all. No, I but love But that's that. how I would think of it. Like, yeah, this is just one element. This is just like one thing in the pot. I love that. I love that. You know, I think the film industry, and I, you know, I'm this. I'm sure it's just as much in the music industry as well. There, there's such narratives of like, of like your first, like your first feature is make or break. Like, yeah. look at what, look at what you know, Quentin Tarantino did. Not that I'm like trying to be like Quentin Tarantino. No, no, but, no. You know, like that's course, a the, the frequent example is like, look what Qu- Quentin Tarantino did with his yeah. first movie, and look what yeah. this person did with their first movie. Even these are, and these are even false narratives because Quentin Tarantino's Absolutely. first movie was a a failed experiment shot on 16 millimeter that burned in a fire and no one has ever seen. So, uh, (laughs) you know, uh, exactly. But but those narratives, uh, I, I do, I do fall prey to them. And, and, you know, funny enough, because you talk about that, like next project impulse, I almost started picking up and reading a biography today for like the next filmmaker. I want big filmmaker. I want to cover on behind the slate after I finished production and then I, I stopped myself. I was like, I can't get sucked into this like, <laughs> other, into this yeah, like uh, historical research. Like I've got too much. I, I've got people are waiting to get paid. Like I can't of just course, like, spend, of course. spend my day reading a biography. But um, uh, so no, I, 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 I definitely relate. But I love what you said about the body of work. I also feel like the first one doesn't, uh, in my opinion, if the first one is the best one or the most groundbreaking one, then there, there's something wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? It's like, yeah. yeah, the first one can be good, but like, it's got to build. Like, we got to build, you know? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, to be fair, I'm, I am I totally know where you're coming from because I've been making this movie for like, I don't know how many years. It's still, I think I still have like four more years to go. We don't have the money we need. Like, it's just making a movie is a nightmare. I mean, this is why I'm just like the film industry. I'm just like, this is some crazy stuff. Like it's, it's wild and it's so many moving parts and it's so many people. And it's like, just, it's like, it's like pushing, you know, it's like the Herzog thing of like pushing a boat uphill. Like that's how it feels to make a film. Tell us a little bit about this project because you're, you're, creating an animated film version of your show, Ogress. So t- tell us a little bit about Ogress first, and then why do you feel that animation is the way to bring this to life? It's about a, it's about an ogress who lives in the woods near a village. And it's a love story. It's funny. It's dark. It's sad. It's about nature. It's about being an outsider. Um, and I... I think very early on in the writing process of the music, I just kept seeing... Like, I kept feeling like it needed to be visual. Um, and since I draw, I started drawing her. And I started thinking, well, animation is actually the perfect medium for me. Because animation involves drawing, which is one of my favorite things to do. And it involves music. Um, historically, and even just, like, it's, like, the way I could have drawings move to my music. Um and little did I know, of course, how I knew it was expensive. I didn't know how expensive it was <laughs> or how long it took. I think as a kid, I used to watch like Pocahontas and Lion King and all these Disney movies. And like, I think we all just took for granted the amount of work, the amount of like hands working, <laughs> hands moving to create these flowing, like super just, you know, graceful moving figures i just thought they were real and then suddenly i'm like oh wait (laughs) people are drawing these and uh there's hundreds upon hundreds of people working on these films um so anyway it was yeah pretty early i was like i was drawing her i was thinking about it visually and i thought oh it needs to be animated um and that was five years ago and we're still in development. Wow. So hopefully we'll be in production this time next year. And it takes maybe two, three years. So I think overall from when we started, when I started writing this to when it's over and out and done, I think it'll be a 10 year, like a decade project. 
Wow. Yeah. How does that feel, you know, given that sort of the, these other, you know, this other part of your artistry that you've talked about of like always looking to the next thing, always looking to the next thing. And now all of a sudden having this like 10 year process, has that been difficult? Oh yeah. Difficult, frustrating. I'm constantly being like, it's never going to happen. I'm like crying about it every, you know, once a year. Like, I'm just like, it's not, it's not going to work. It's not working. Forget it. Like I give up, I quit. I don't care. Um, yeah. And I, I'm really lucky to have a team that believes in it. What for when I don't, <laughs> for when I'm like, no, I'm, I'm over this. And I have like a great producer in the U S his name is John Carlin and my co-director. And, you know, they'll, they'll take the relay and be like, no, no, no. Like it's happening. It's, it's going to happen. And it's like, no, it's not. But you know, yeah. So it's, it's, it's such an interesting process. It's such a, I guess this is like the new opera. You know what I mean? Like this, this medium is like the new opera. Like, you know, in the way that opera was this, it, there's still pe op people making operas now, but in the heyday yeah, of but... opera, I was like, I'm even thinking like 20th, early 20th century. It was like, we're getting a whole team of people to make this work. Yes. Uh, to make this, this art together. And it requires so many moving parts. So many people have to approve things. And it's just like, it's a whale. Yes. And, uh, I, you know, people would go to the opera. Now, I, no, not as many people go to the opera. I, I think film is, is, is really this all-inclusive sort of artwork that's like, it has music, it has story, it has acting or theater. It has like, it just has everything, you know? Um, and that's what makes it so hard, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's an interesting comparison too. Also in the way that um, uh, at a certain point, the economics of opera, in many ways, it kind of like began to collapse under its own weight. I, I, I read... Um, a fascinating biography about the Hammerstein oh. uh, family. Oscar Hammerstein. Oh gosh, I can't. I, the first or the second? The one before the um, before Rogers, the one we uh, know. Yeah, Rogers and Hammerstein. That was Hammerstein the second, and so his father. Yeah, I believe. Yeah. If I, if I get this wrong, someone send me an email. Um, but his father was like, um, you know, he basically like founded Broadway. He built the first theater mm. on what would become Broadway. Mm. And it was this grand pleasure palace, but, and he, it had all this vaudeville and like multiple stages and everything, but it was all to support his dream of creating this like giant opera in New York. Um, and like wow. the vaudeville and everything else was really working as like a popular entertainment, but like they couldn't get traction with the opera. That's so um, interesting. And, and this is even in the late 1890s, early, early yeah. 20th century. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and that, at that point, the economics of the opera were already somewhat dooming these like grand ventures. Yes. And, and the audience retention just like wasn't there. Um, and, and I wonder if film is beginning to be at somewhat of a cross of the similar crossroads, because I think the distribution models like the, the cash flow is just it's going to be so much less than it was even just t 10, five years yeah. ago. I wonder also, because I, I find it to be interesting, because I feel like, in a way, it's very expensive to make a film, but also in a way, it's like, it has never been cheaper to make a film. Right. Right? Uh, depending on which, where you're, go what you're doing. Right, um, right. But yeah, I think it's, it's such a, such a weird, weird place to be in, and not to talk about the strike, but, you know, there's money. <laughs> like, there's a lot of money to be making these things like there's money for art there's money for film like people could get paid it's not it wouldn't be that hard for anyone but it's just you know it's just it's getting more and more difficult i think and it's getting harder and harder to find i think patrons who really care and like are willing to give a little bit up of, 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 you know, their riches and, and to earn and to earn that trust and, and even to like communicate a vision that's not purely based on um, 
monetary return. I mean, of course, absolutely. Like mon- That's really what I mean. Of course, monetary return is the goal, uh, you know, but like, it, sure, it, it shouldn't. But like our culture is so attuned to like, that is the only goal and that there isn't value to be found elsewhere. Yes. And like some of the best, some of the best things in art that we love it had no monetary return. Like, right. right. And it's like, somebody just was like, okay, here's, here's some money. Just do the thing. You know? I mean, I even think about somebody like David Lynch, who was, who did eraser head, like with a full-time job and he did it over two years or something. Right. And was just like, I'll pay for this. <laughs> like, I'll figure this out, you know? Yeah. And it was slower than it would have been if, if he had just like one, one person give him what he needed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, I, like I think a lot about these sort of like these great independent film achievements, but I think it's, that's where the, like the actual, like the low cost of, to make a film today, it, you know, that just, it, it makes it that much more competitive. And David Lynch. That's had, so interesting. You know, actually. There's like, cause like there's, 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 you know, there's 50,000 David Lynch's in America right now yes. like, trying to do this. And but what we don't have is an infrastructure of second run theaters willing to show midnight movies where Eraser had found its audience and gained traction. And we don't have that. That is so interesting. Yeah. You just have YouTube where you have a bajillion other things that everybody is watching and nobody really is. It's like not an event. Right, right. Everything is flattened or you have the splash page of Netflix, which I don't think is going to be favoring the next eraser head anytime soon. No, (laughs) and we're not going to watch it. Like if it's on our splash page, we're not watching that. You know what I mean? Yeah, Yeah, it's, it's tough. You're right. I didn't think about that. It's like, I didn't think about the fact that yes, because it's so cheap, it's actually so much more competitive. And so it's like, <laughs> yeah, even, I mean, even with music, it's like, it's never been cheaper to make music. You can make an album at, on your iPhone at home yeah. on your garage band, but it's like, how do you like separate yourself out from, from everyone else? Like, how do you, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. How, how have you separated yourself? I got lucky. <laughs> I got lucky. Um, it was good timing. And to be honest, I have no idea. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like, I feel like when I do think about that stuff, if I were to try, I probably would fail. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't know what the right, what the right move, what's the word I'm looking for? I wouldn't know what the right move is to like, quote unquote, go viral. Like, I even see it with my TikTok. I mean, it's like such a different, this is like a totally different conversation, but it's linked in a way where I go, oh, oh, if I do this, this is going to go viral. People are going to like, people are going to watch this. Yeah. Nothing. And then I do something (laughs) that I'm like, casually, I don't care. And I'm like, no one's going to see this. And that's the thing that, you know what I mean? And I'm just like, I don't get it. (laughs) So I don't know how, I don't know how this stuff works. Thank God I'm not a PR person. Thank God, you know. Nobody wants to hire me to do that stuff for them. I love that. I, I love that. And I love you because that <laughs> is, fu- that is fucking honest. And like, it, I, you know, my Instagram is like filled with like targeted ads of these charlatans, you know, promising you like how to get your film in a film festival or like, I'm going to teach yeah. you the secret to do this. And it, I, I, it's just, I, I call bullshit because yeah. the people. There's, you know, I, I, I was on a panel, um, I was on a panel a couple years ago to nominate someone for this thing called the Glenn Gould Award, which is a an award that they give in Canada to like an artist. And it's like a good amount of money and it's lifetime achievement type of thing. And on the nominee list, there were a bunch of people that we all know and love and like are very famous. And there was this one filmmaker whose name was Alanis. Obam Sawin. She is an indigenous Canadian filmmaker and she is 91 years old. Uh, at the time of the award, she must have been 89. She has made so many films, documentaries about indigenous community in, uh, in Canada. Beautiful films. We, none of us on the panel or 
not many of us on the panel had heard of her. We watched her films. We were completely moved. We gave her the award because she deserved it because of this, you know, back to this idea of like this body of work that she had been, she never stopped making films. And when we announced, like we, we FaceTimed her, they're like, you can FaceTime her or zoom her and she'll see all your faces. Tell her that she won the award. Um, she was on set. She was like 89 on set, like doing another documentary. And I was just like, I love, I love this woman that has, has, is such an inspiration to me because it's just like, she just never stopped making movies. Wow. You know? And it's like, there's, there's really something to be learned from people like that. Just persistence, but also like, it's a joy for her. She just loves doing it. Yeah. She wants to make the movies. It doesn't matter. That's her life. Yeah. That's what she does with her life. It's incredible. I just, I, I, I just got goosebumps all over. I'll send uh, you, I'll send amazing. you her name and like, you'll, uh, I'll send you like a link to, to some of her stuff. Yes. Yes. I, oh my God. That's so cool. Uh, she was on set. I just love on set. Um, okay. So I have, I have several questions with a little bit more rapid fire to, to round out, to round out the conversation. Uh, sure. and this is just like, sort of like looking back on your journey that has brought you to today. And, okay. and some of this may be ground we've already covered in the conversation, but we'll just, we'll just see what comes up. Okay. What is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Pass. And, and I'll, maybe I'll, maybe it'll come to me. Pass, pass. Okay. What is the most challenging lesson you've had to learn? <sighs> These questions. These are good questions. What is the most challenging lesson I've had to learn? Um, this is, this goes back to the, people pleasing thing when you stop people pleasing people stop being pleased and it's okay <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a good one for me that's great what has your inner voice been telling you everything you need is right in front of you what brings you the most joy conversations that like it's like a mix between like banter and conversation like conversations where you feel like you can build a world with someone i don't know if that makes any sense but just where it just like, like you're, you're in this conversational flow with someone. Um, I love that. That brings me so much joy. What are you most grateful for? My family, my family, my friends and my family. What advice would you give to any artist out there trying to find their way through a career in independent art? Keep making stuff. Keep making bad stuff. Arts and crafts. <laughs> yeah. Keep making bad arts and crafts. Put googly eyes on everything. Keep going. Keep making it. Make more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beautiful. Cecile, thank you so much for joining me today. Where can people follow you? Where can people find out more about your work? So uh, I am on Instagram at Cecile McLaurin Salvant a long name but if you google me you, you could just google cecile jazz and you will find me and you will find my <laughs> tiktok and my website and my instagram um and i'm i'm on tour a lot of the year so i might be in a town near you uh that information will be on my website uh on the concerts page so cecile mclaurin salvant.com and if you have the opportunity to see cecile live do not miss it. Go see Come on, the show. come see us. <laughs> it will it will blow your mind. Oh, and I forgot. I'm on I'm on all the platform, the listening stuff, the streaming stuff. I'm on yes. YouTube, I'm on Spotify, I'm on whatever, everything. We will we will have a lot of links to these down in the show notes, so if anyone is curious, will you can go right down there and uh, check it out. Thank you to everyone out there for listening. Be sure to follow us at Behind the Slate Pod. You can email me your questions, comments. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Behind the Slate Pod at gmail.com. That's Behind the Slate Pod at gmail.com. Be sure to give us a rating and review if you're on a, a podcasting app. Hit the five stars. It really helps us out. And until next time, that is a wrap.